Township Worship Troy Hills Township Council Agenda Meeting, December 11, 2012. Public invited, public participation. Uh, meeting called to order by myself at 7.31 p.m. Please rise for a flag salute. Mr. Farr. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Roll call. <coughs> Mr. Carifi. Here. Mr. DePiro. Here. Mr. Ferrara. Here. Mr. Nelson. Here. Mr. Stanton. Here. Others present. Mayor Barbario, Jasmine Lynn, Business Administrator, Paul Cazzarelli, Assistant Business Administrator, Justin Marquette, Township Attorney, Yancy Wazirmas, Township Clerk. Purpose of this meeting is to set the agenda for the regular Township Council meeting, December 18, 2012. Formal action may or may not be taken. Statement of compliance. Adequate notice of this meeting has been provided in accordance with the requirements of the open public meeting law by filing the notice in the office of the township clerk and by posting the meeting notice on the build, uh, bulletin board of the municipal building on December 15, 2011, where it has remained posted since that date. A legal notice appeared in both the Delhi Record and the Star Ledger and it was forwarded by fax to other local newspapers and local radio on December 19, 2011. Note, council meetings are videotaped and air on cable public SS channel 12 at 1 p.m. on Saturday and they are also available for viewing at www.persibony.net. Presentations, presentation by OEM on township preparation response to Tropical Storm Sandy by Chief Anthony DeCenzo and Captain Jeffrey Storms. How are you? Yep. How are you? I don't think it's on, Chief. Testing, how's that? Good evening, everyone. Uh, I have just a couple of uh, brief comments to make before we get started here this evening. Uh, I think first and foremost, foremost is we need to recognize that there's still an awful lot of people suffering in the aftermath of Hurricane Sandy, uh, both here in Parsippany as well as statewide and in the tri-state area. Uh, we do not stand before you this evening in an attempt to uh, garner any accolades for our response either prior to, during, or after the event. Uh, we responded to emergency situations during this event to the best of our ability and a whole variety of different uh, situations had to be dealt with, as you'll see as we go through the presentation here this evening. At the appropriate time, we will do a thorough critique of all the responses by the emergency services here in the community, uh, both paid services and volunteer services, to try to identify some areas where we feel that we can improve upon. And again, our ultimate goal is to better serve the citizens of Precipity Troy Hills. Uh, before we move further with the program, I need to recognize a few groups of people. Uh, first and foremost, the citizens of this community. Uh, when the information came out that we were about to experience a storm of unprecedented magnitude, the people of the community responded. They prepared. They got gas from their generators. They got water for their homes. They took whatever necessary precautions they could to help themselves. Very, very important. In addition to that, volunteers here in Precipity were fortunate to have people that during crises, during emergencies, they've proven themselves over and over again, are willing to leave their own homes, leave their loved ones to help others. Without people like that, we couldn't possibly respond the way that we did. In addition to that, the township employees that responded worked tirelessly through the whole event. Uh, a lot of them working outside of their own job responsibilities, uh, thinking outside the box in an effort to, again, uh, rectify problems that needed to be addressed throughout this entire event. So without further ado, at this point, uh, from the police department, uh, we're going to have two presentations. First, Captain Jeffrey Storms regarding the Office of Emergency Management and how the uh, office responded. And then after that, Captain James Carifi for the uh, law enforcement response. Thank you. Without further ado, Captain Storms. Good evening. On behalf of the men and women of the Parsippany Police Department, the Parsippany Office of Emergency Management, township employees and all of the emergency service workers both volunteer and paid I'd like to thank you for your kind invitation to address the council this evening regarding Hurricane Sandy 
In May of 2012, Mayor Barbario placed the authority and responsibility of operating the Office of Emergency Management under the Police Department and named Chief DeZenzo as the OEM coordinator. On July 17, 2012, I was promoted to the rank of captain and in addition to my current duties and responsibilities was tasked with overseeing the operation of the Parsippany Office of Emergency Management. Three months and 12 days later, on October 29, 2012, the state of New Jersey was hit by Hurricane Sandy, one of the most devastating and destructive storms in our state's history. In the months preceding the hurricane, Chief DeZenzo and I met with the New Jersey State Police OEM representative Sergeant Mario Sinatra, Morris County Director of Law and Public Safety, Director Scott DiGirolamo, and Morris County Director of Emergency Management, Jeff Paul, all in an effort to establish clear lines of communication, identify organizational roles, and help coordinate the efforts of responding agencies in the event of a widespread emergency or natural disaster. On a local level, the Chief and I met personally with most of the Township's emergency service organizations by responding directly to their individual buildings to discuss the role of OEM and share our philosophy of maintaining a team approach to the delivery of emergency services throughout the township. As news of the impending hurricane broke, Chief DeZenzo assembled the command staff of the police department, which in turn addressed staffing needs for the department to include police officers, police special officers, and dispatchers for a 10-day period commencing on Monday, October 29th. Chief DeZenzo and I requested to meet with Mayor Barbario, Business Administrator Jasmine Lim, and the heads of township departments critical to the needs of our community, including Bill Bober from the Sewer Utility, Kevin Ryan from the Water Utility, Jim Walsh from Parks and Forestry, Greg Schneider from DPW, and Barbara Iavoli from the Human Services Department. At this initial meeting, which was the first of many over the following days, we discussed preparedness, communication, staffing, equipment, and maintaining a state of operational readiness for all departments before, during, and after the hurricane. On Friday, October 26, 2012, I met with the mayor and the representatives of all township emergency services. At that meeting, we also discussed maintaining a state of operational readiness throughout the hurricane, provided the initial National Weather Service forecast, and stressed the importance of responding safely to calls for emergency service. On that Friday afternoon, the Emergency Operations Center at Police Headquarters was prepared and ready for increased telephone calls from residents requesting assistance, to maintain situational awareness of the event, to establish a link to the Marsh County Office of Emergency Management in the event of requests for emergency supplies and equipment, and as a meeting room to meet with the department heads for daily updates. In my role as the commander of the Professional Standards Division, I oversee the disclosure of public information to the media the maintenance of the department website, as well as our social media outlets such as Facebook, Twitter, Nixle, and Constant Contact. Sergeant Yvonne Cristiano and particularly Patrolman Earl Kinsey were tasked with providing and posting as much information available regarding hurricane-related issues to our media outlets in an effort to provide our community and our followers with up-to-date information as it became available. This proved to be a tremendous resource for our residents in the days and weeks to come. On Saturday, October 27th, Governor Christie declared a state of emergency throughout the entire state. In response to residents' requests, sand and sandbags were provided to residents in Lake Hiawatha for areas that are prone to flooding. DPW delivered the initial supply of sand, and when it was depleted, OEM was able to procure several tandem dump trucks of sand from local business owner Phil Netto. Over 5,500 bags were distributed, and eventually all of the sand was depleted at the sandbag operation. On Monday, October 29th, Mayor Barbario declared a local state of emergency and the Emergency Operations Center was opened and staffed. Our volunteer emergency radio communications group, RACES, staffed their operation 24 hours a day in the event of radio failure. Our CERT volunteers readied themselves to be available to staff warming centers and shelters. Volunteer fire districts and ambulance stations took every precaution regarding staffing and equipment to ready their respective stations in the event of an emergency. The immediate effect of Hurricane Sandy was the widespread loss of power throughout the town. Homes, businesses, streetlights, traffic signals, and gas stations all lost electrical power immediately, and unfortunately for some, it would be 10 days or more before the power was restored. The effect of losing power in our homes was devastating. For those of us that did not have a generator, all refrigerated fro and frozen food was lost, and we could not heat our homes. 
Residents with electrical appliance could not cook. Home telephones that require electricity did not work. Home computers could not be turned on. Schools were closed, grocery stores were closed, and for the food stores that remained open, stock ran low. Our local roads and highways became impassable due to downed trees, live electrical wires, and snap telephone poles. Unmanned intersections with traffic signals not working presented a danger to drivers on the roadway. For residents that had generators, the availability of fuel at gas stations that remained open was threatened. For gas stations that had fuel but no power, they could not pump fuel. For gas stations that had power but no fuel, they were forced to close. And for gas stations that had both power and fuel, the potential for unrest grew as the demand for gasoline ran greater than the supply, ultimately forcing the police to provide security at local gas stations and Governor Christie to enforce odd even gas rationing restrictions. The loss of electrical power throughout the township remained our biggest threat to the safety and well-being of our residents. While restoring power to our residents was our paramount concern, the maintenance of our sewer and water utilities was vital to residents' day-to-day -day living. The pumps used to process wastewater throughout the township require electrical power. The sewer utility was able to use the generator backup system to continue to process wastewater. Should, for any reason, the sewer utility had lost the ability to remain on emergency generator, the residents and businesses would have faced a backup of their sewer system and a widespread and devastating health concern. The drinking water throughout the township is derived from underground wells. The water is then pumped to above ground storage tanks. The loss of electrical power stopped the well pumps and our remaining supply of water throughout the township ultimately began to decline. OEM, along with the water department, was able to procure emergency generators for the water utility to remain operational. A plea to conserve water was issued and our water supply returned to normal. Additionally, with the assistance of Wawa, Taylor Oil, and Parsippany Fuel Oil, the township received nearly 10,000 gallons of diesel fuel required to keep the generators functioning and diesel trucks running at the sewer utility, water utility, parks and forestry, and DPW. Human services set up and staffed two warming centers, locations, and an overnight shelter for all residents that were in need of their service. Rescue and Recovery delivered emergency generators to residents requiring power to operate vital medical devices. Volunteer fire districts responded to numerous calls for service in their respective fire districts. Emergency medical treatment was provided to all residents that requested the service from both volunteered and paid squads. Parks and Forestry and volunteer fire districts were able to clear down trees off of our roadways, but only in cases where trees were not entangled in power lines. DPW further assisted in clearing catch basins, storm drains, roadways, setting up barricades and traffic signs, collecting garbage, recycling, and leaf bags from the roadways. Additionally, DPW cleared the roadways during the subsequent nor'easter. In addition to local roads being closed, parts of Route 10, Route 202, Route 53, and Route 46 were also closed to traffic due to downed trees, poles, and wires. The list of downed trees and wires, as well as closed roadways, was provided to JCPNL every day. Additionally, the JCPNL representatives at the Marsh County Emergency Operations Center were contacted every day on behalf of our residents. Police officers responded to locations in the street to meet with JCPNL foremen in an effort to restore power to our residents and cleared roadways to ensure safe travel. I can sympathize with fellow residents and can appreciate their frustration in not having power restored, as I was without power for 10 days as well. Some people in our community, our country, and our state continue to suffer the effects of Hurricane Sandy. Homes were destroyed, businesses were closed, claims were made to insurance companies, and applications were made to FEMA for assistance. Some suffered a loss of income. Students will have to make up missed school days. Our families, friends, and neighbors all have been impacted by some of the negative effects of the hurricane. There is no victory to be had in trying to manage a response to a natural disaster of this magnitude. Now is not the time for self-congratulations or praise. This is the third natural disaster to hit our town in 14 months. This was the first time that the Office of Emergency Management coordinated its response under the authority of the police department. We don't measure our success, but instead focus on how to better respond to the next event. This presentation is merely an overview and an opportunity to inform our community about the efforts put forth by our township employees and emergency service volunteers. 
Once again, it was our residents that proved to be our best resource for information, and through their patience, support, and understanding, we as a community were able to overcome the worst natural disaster the town has ever faced. Our community helps to support township employees, the police department, the Office of Emergency Management, and the volunteers in our emergency service organizations. And on behalf of all, I would like to express my gratitude to the residents of our town for their support during such a traumatic and difficult event. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Captain Storms. And that's the shortest part of our presentation. Everything is going to be longer than that. Uh, at this point, Captain uh, Karifi is going to come up and he's going to give an overview of the operational response of the uh, police department. Couple props. How come so small? <laughs> there you go. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> My name is Griffey, and I'm assigned to the patrol division. I'm the commander of that division. And let me start out by echoing the comments by the chief and Captain Storms that as a Persephone resident, uh, I've never seen anything. My 26 years in law enforcement, I've never seen anything that the township experienced on October 29th, the damage that was done. Uh, just to reiterate some of the things that me and as well as the rest of the police department experienced prior to the storm, as indicated, we met and the chief had uh, authorized specific scheduling. If some of you are already familiar with the scheduling of the police department, we supplemented that with three additional shifts of officers in anticipation of what was to come on October 29th. In addition to the patrol officers, we did that with our dispatchers as well. We wanted, usually we maintain two dispatchers, we wanted to maintain four in anticipation of the call volume that we were anticipating receiving. So we maintain that, we try to maintain that four dispatchers throughout the entire event, 24 hours a day. And in addition to that, we did the police officers as well. And some of the statistics that I will give you are, are basically bare facts. After the initial storm hit, we set up a command post in the chief's conference room. And as you see here, this map was set up and all the road closures and traffic lights that were out, down wires that were significant in the township were all listed on here. And day by day, we would address this as Captain Storms had said earlier. In addition to the police officers that were scheduled to additional shifts, the dispatchers, we also utilize our special police officers. We utilize them for fixed traffic posts as well as the shelters. We had to maintain police presence at the shelters that were set up, so we had to utilize them at these facilities as well. The roads that were closed in the initial on October 29th were 61 roads were closed. And what we did was after the, the initial storm, and we were able to, on our night shift, each officer assigned to a specific section in town, which obviously most of you know that we divide the section up into parts, different parts, were assigned to go through each area of their section and log what roads were impassable. And what they would do is in the, at the end of the night, we would take that list and compile it into sections, and then we would turn, turn it over to Captain Storms and Office of Emergency Management. And we did this every night throughout the entire storm, all the way up in, until uh, November 9th. And I'll give you some specific numbers about the road closures. On day three, once we got a handle on all the roads that were done and utilizing the map, there were 61 roads on day three. Day four was 48. Day five was 39. Day six was 36. Day seven was 33. Day eight was 28. Day nine was 10. Day 10 was eight. And day 11, we still had six roads that were closed. Traffic lights that were out. We had, on October 29th, on the initial day of the storm, we had 29 traffic lights in the township that were out. And they st subsequently started coming back on. On November 2nd, was 27 traffic lights were out. On November 3rd, there was 17. November 4th, there was 16. November 5th, there was 16. November 6th, there was 12. November 7th, there was five. And November 8th, they were all, out of those 29, they were all functioning at that point. It was difficult to try to maintain, as you can imagine, some of those traffic lights were Route 202 and Route 10. There are significant traffic lights in town that needed to be manned and or observed for traffic. So what we did was in, with uh, the cooperation of DPW, we utilized some signage and some, they, we blocked off some of the intersections so people could only turn right or turn left or not be able to uh, use that intersection. And it seemed to work out well. Knock on wood, we didn't have any accidents, so 
that seemed to work out. We also had 21 trees that fell onto houses throughout the initial storm. Gas stations. We have 19 gas stations in our township. Now, what became a little confusing at that point was because we didn't know which gas stations were opening up. They, it wasn't like they called us and said, hey, we're going to open up. Or We have uh, a generator which we're going to use to pump the gasoline. So what happened there is eventually we, we developed a system that came into play and we were able to provide security at these facilities because what happened, as Captain Storms had said originally, is that People wanted to get gas and weren't able to because of when the governor put into the odds and even numbers, people just wanted to go and regardless of what the case was. And we had some specific incidents in, involving that. We had an officer hit by a car. We had uh, an arrest at one of the gas stations. And we also had a threat of a gun at one of them as well. And then also the only thing that I could provide to you if you want is uh, the overview of our calls that we've uh, uh, that responded to over that period of time. And I'll just give you a, just a, maybe some two, two specific ones that you may be interested in are the down trees. We had 136 down trees that were reported in. And down wires, we had 47. And the call volume, we responded on just strictly service calls to about 205. Now, again, I can go on and on and on about our motor vehicle accidents, our alarms, our fire alarms, our the domestic violence arrests that we had, and again, on and on and on. But uh, basically, from the patrol aspect of it, that's, that's my presentation. Thank you. Any questions of me? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> At this point, what we're going to do is we're going to go uh, have some of the department heads come up and explain some of the situations that they were faced with uh, through the storm. And I can't impress upon you enough how critical it was. Uh, we would hold two meetings a day of all the department heads. Uh, it wasn't the most popular thing to do, but at that meeting, uh, we all kept each other abreast of what was going on, and we could deal with individual, individual issues across the board, whether it was a water department issue or a police issue. We would all sit down around a table uh, and try to work through these problems collectively. Again, some of us working outside of our primary responsibilities and thinking outside the box, but this is the way we had to function to get through the storm. So at this point, uh, Greg Snyder from uh, DPW, Come on up. Good evening. How are you guys? All right? Everybody good? Um, real quickly, Jeff so eloquently uh, went over basically everything that occurred uh, with DPW. I would like to take you back to the very beginning of the storm and tell you a little bit about how my men reacted to it. We were expecting 8 to 10 inches of rain which, you know, with a blessing, we did not get it. Um, so my concern, obviously, was the river was going to uh, overflow. Uh, as I say, we were very, very happy to see that the rain only turned out to be about an inch. The river <coughs> didn't even move. But we did supply all of the uh, sandbags and everything that was needed um, in c case uh, we had that deluge. Uh, my men spent the weekend. I probably had about three or four crews working constantly, assisting uh, the preparation with the police department and the uh, uh, OEM staff and so forth and so on. Sunday afternoon we made the decision in one of the OEM meetings to not to uh, proceed with the garbage and recycling collection with the, another one of my divisions. We decided to cancel it for Monday. Uh, I still had some men show up Monday morning that did not get the message. Uh, we found out that the message did not get out to the public quick enough. Uh, we didn't react. We didn't know, at least I didn't realize, the storm was going to get be as windy as it was. And what transpired that Monday morning is that uh, I felt that there was just too many people that did not get the message about garbage. And we had quite a few people on quite a few streets in town that still had garbage on it. So I sent two crews out. The rest of the uh, department was not working. I sent two crews out to clean up what was ever out there. Uh, and obviously, I think it was a good move because that night the wind picked up to 60, 70 miles an hour. Uh, for the next three days, we did not do any garbage and recycling collection, uh, but we were back to full speed on Thursday morning. Uh, we had a lot of uh, streets that were obviously closed. We tried to get the message out to everybody that uh, if you have garbage and we can't get down your, your street, bring it to the end of the street. My men. Uh, we're very successful in picking up a lot of garbage from areas that they could not even get into. The road division then went into operation assisting the Parks and Forestry Department 
uh, with the cleaning of the streets, uh, which we are still doing. And uh, I'd just like to, uh, keeping it brief, say that I was very proud of what uh, uh, my men accomplished and so forth. So thank you. Uh, at this point, we're going to have uh, Kevin Ryan from the Water Department come on up. Thank you, Chief. Good evening. I'm just going to give you a very, very brief overline of what we did during the storm. As you can imagine, um, we were running 24-7. We have 37 facilities to maintain, and just keeping everything going was a, was a nightmare. Uh, storm preparation began the week before, as we do with any predicted event. Checking all emergency equipment, topping off our fuel tanks, and topping off our water storage tanks on Sunday the 28th. Monday evening the 29th, we lost power to all of our facilities. Within an hour, Jersey Central restored circuit 37677, which gave power back to six of our stations. Additional personnel were called in, and between the OEM and the contractors we had on standby, generators were secured and began powering up key stations. On Tuesday, 30th, the first advisory to conserve water was issued. Friday the 2nd, as it became clear this was going to be a prolonged event, we issued an advisory that our pumping ability was critically low. We also changed the hours of our pump operators to 16-hour shifts, which overlapped, so there were always at least two men in the control room. By Saturday the 3rd, we had two crews refueling all generator tanks every four hours, consuming over 900 gallons a day. Monday the 5th, Jersey Central restored power to four more of our facilities. By Thursday the 7th, power was restored to all of our facilities and we returned to normal operations. Thank you. Uh, at this point, we have uh, Phil Bober from the uh, sewer utility. Um, we uh, started about a week before the storm. Uh, Phil, can you raise up the microphone? Sure. <laughs> no, we just have to talk yeah. There we go. There you go. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we we checked all electrical circuits and generators at each uh, pump station. Um, filled all our, our diesel tanks and removed all debris or secured all, all uh, flying objects in the plants so, so that there wouldn't be any damage. When this storm hit, however, because the power from JCP and L became e erratic, uh, our pump started to shut down. So uh, as the storm hit, we came back up to the plant, found out, out the problem, detached our plant from our uh, high voltage transformer so, so we could start the emergency uh, generators. Uh, at no time, however, was there any danger that uh, uh, we were going to lose s sewer service for our town or any of, of the, the towns we uh, served. For uh, the next two days, we um, figured out, out Oh, a way to adjust our high voltage transformers to work with the e e erratic power and were able to go back on to, to the grid. This uh, allowed us to give full service, not just to our towns, but we've become a repository for over 58 other towns to uh, prevent them from spilling uh, sewage sludge in, in, into the lakes 
and uh, you know streams. Uh, when the s s storm hit, nobody could find any food, so we uh, purchased over twenty-five hundred uh, dollars worth of food and fed everybody who was out on uh, uh, you know you know uh, call. Um, and uh, be because of um, our efforts in helping other towns, uh, we will probably pay for a good portion of the uh, uh, overtime that the uh, storm caused here. Um, anything else? I, d I just have one question, Mr. Council President. Uh, Mr. Bober, you, s you said that uh, we were a repository for over 58 towns uh, af uh, from the aftermath. How many towns are we still servicing at this point? 58. Oh, right, currently still. It's like a day, it's like a day one uh, at the plant that will continue possibly through the end of uh, January. Okay. Great. Thank you. We have uh, a accepted over 1,100 trucks into the plant to help other towns. Okay. Great. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Phil. Uh, at this point, we're going to call up uh, Jim Walsh from uh, Parks. Oh, there he is. I'm Jim's Jim's replacement. Doug Jones is <laughs> Parks and Forestry Department. Um, the Parks and Forestry Department started Friday prior to the storm, readying all our equipment that we have available to uh, use for the storm. Uh, we started uh, 5 a.m. Monday, which is early, to ensure our personnel could get into work and uh, get deployed out onto the roads um, for faster response. Uh, as the weather continued, we worked through the night, Monday, Tuesday, to make sure the roads were passable. Uh, we were on the roads that we were able to work on. Uh, by Thursday that week, uh, utilizing the garbage collection routes, uh, we began picking up residents' debris, uh, continuing to respond also to dangerous tree complaints from the police department. Uh, the tub grinder that we bought three years ago uh, has been an absolute invaluable tool for this past two storms. Uh, we work seven days a week. With much help from the other departments uh, for labor equipment until Thanksgiving. The second trip through town is about 75% complete, uh, should be complete by Christmas. And we, when completed, we will uh, begin our uh, work through our parks, which we have not been able to get even to yet. Uh, and that's it for me. At uh, this point, last but not least, the uh, shelters uh, were handled by, by Barbara Ivoli. Barbara? Good evening. If you ever took um, Shelter 101 course, they tell you to prepare for 72 hours. We ran shelters for 12 days. I just want to thank, publicly thank, the um, Board of Education Building Maintenance Department they were invaluable to us um, with their help, and also the volunteer CERT team wouldn't have been able to do it without them. The Department of Human Services started to prep for the um, shelter openings the week before. We opened our first shelter Monday afternoon, which was October 29th, at Lake Hiawatha School. Our first guests arrived at 8.40 that night when power um, started to shut down. At approximately 10.15 that evening um, when we were putting some residents you know, to bed and others were playing games, we lost part of the roof at Lake Hiawatha School. And due to the quick thinking of the building maintenance department, ushered everyone into the hallways, locked the doors, and kept everybody safe through the night. The next day when we saw the devastation from the roof, 
we moved our operations to Littleton School. That was Tuesday. That day we had 124 guests. Wednesday, when we saw it was going to be a prolonged event, we opened a second location at Parsippany High School and split the staff into two. Littleton School, we serviced 187 guests at the high school 41. Thursday, we kept both operations going. Littleton School, 170 guests. The high school, 114 guests. Friday, power was restored at the Parsippany Community Center, and we knew the schools wanted to get um, ready for Monday opening. So we prepared to have the um, Parsippany Community Center open Friday evening at 6 o'clock. Friday during the day, we had 163 guests at Littleton School, 157 at the high school. 6 o'clock, we opened the Parsippany Community Center. Saturday at the community center, we had 136 guests. Sunday, 129. Monday, we restored um, services at the community center with our staff, plus ran, ran the shelter at the same time. Plus, we had voting that week also. Monday, we had 96 guests. Tuesday, 92. Wednesday, 83. Thursday, 15. And Friday, 11, 9, we closed the shelter at 5 o'clock. In total, we serviced over 1,500 guests through those 12 days. Um, just so you know, our food expense was only $300 for those 12 days, thanks to the graciousness of businesses and mostly the residents. I was just amazed at how residents came and just brought supplies, fed everybody, and it was just um, a great a concerted effort from, from all from town. Thank you. Anybody have any questions? Just one. Um, the community center would seem like a natural place to, to uh, make a shelter, just mm -hmm. with the facilities that are there. Uh, is it something that the township should perhaps look into getting an emergency generator? So it, It's in the budget. It was in the budget for 2012. We, the um, specs were on my desk during the hurricane. We did spec out for uh, a diesel generator and as we discussed it afterwards we're we just got um, new specs in for natural gas so that will definitely be something that you know will be coming in the next few months okay thanks Mark. thank you uh, just in summation I think it's important that we understand the concept of uh, how everybody came together to work through this disaster um, it, this is not about any one entity. It's not about the police department. It's not about DPW. Uh, it's not about OEM. It's about all these people coming together to get through the worst disaster that we've ever been faced with here in Persephone. And uh, myself, uh, you know, I've been in law enforcement for 31 years, and uh, this was quite a monumental undertaking. Uh, it was a privilege for me as the OEM coordinator to have the opportunity to work with all these department heads the volunteers, uh, everybody that came to, to the table to help this community get through this situation and worked tirelessly through the whole event. Uh, that's all we have this evening. If anybody has any questions of me or any one of the uh, <clears throat> I just, go ahead. Okay. Okay. No, I just, I just wanted to say thank you, Chief, and to all the department heads, um, and a, a special thank you to our volunteers, the EMS, and I see members of uh, Rescue and Recovery here. I mean, you guys aren't even being compensated, and you know, just because you care. And uh, I know what a nightmare, you know, this whole Sandy was. And you know, I know it was very hard. And I just want to say thank you to everybody. Thank you. Um, I also want to thank uh, all the volunteers and Captain Karifi, Captain Storm, and I have. Um, a comment to you, Chief, I guess. Um, would you ever think, uh, not right now, but if this ever happens again, God forbid, to maybe keep uh, the council informed like once a week of what's going on? Or at least think about it, because you know what? Because some of the town hall phones were out. I was getting phone calls. Uh, I know Councilman DePiro was getting phone calls. My wife was getting and phone calls. And when citizens tell us, 
as a governing body what's going on I think it's pretty bad I mean just think about it absolutely I, I think there's uh, some lack there that may be I'll address that if I may um, chief um, and I spoke to the councilman about that and I did make phone calls to the council members and I kept them abreast but um, in the future one thing I think we possibly can do which I think is uh, advantageous not only to myself but also to the council members so they can also spread the word is during our meetings we have a set up a 1-800 number like we do with um, the governor's office like we do with the OEM and they would get a phone number and a code to call in during those meetings and they would be involved in the meetings as well so all the information that is dealt with that day because we had two meetings a day one at 10 o'clock and one at 4 o'clock the council would be privy to and in, in that instance what would happen is whatever happens in those meetings the council now knows and they can spread out the news and word to the residents that uh, are calling them so that's something that I think in the future which we, we're going to do uh, hopefully we don't have to ever use it um, but um, considering this is our third uh, uh, disaster you know we need to be prepared so I think that would be a good um, way to keep the council abreast and they would be involved in the phone calls as well because I do know that, uh, like, like Councilman Ferrer said, and, and I know Councilman DePiro, the first day I'm like, man, nobody's calling. It must be, you know. And then to find out you have no phones, it becomes a, you know, it becomes a major issue for the town. Because we had no power at Town Hall almost the whole, up to the 10th day. Right. So we were running on generators as well. My turn. Thank you, Chief. Thank you, everybody. Yeah, I, uh, I, I too would like to, as an elected official, I was I was very proud of and grateful to all of our town employees and our volunteers for extending themselves above and beyond uh, during this catastrophe. Uh, I kept one of the old Bell system phones that still works off the power from the phone company, you know, and every time we have a power failure, I drag that old touchstone up and and uh, and plug it in. So. Town Hall was down, they couldn't, nobody could reach Town Hall, but my number has always been the same. It's been the same for 47 years. So my wife fielded well, maybe about 200 calls from everybody wanting to know what's going on, when they're going to get power back, and they voted for me, and I better get their power back for them. And uh, oh, yeah. we, got, we got the whole gambit of, uh, of phone calls uh, during, that, during that time. Um, uh, I'm, I'm still not done. I had six trees uprooted in my yard, 70-foot trees, and the damage is not going to get fixed until the spring. Uh, it, it was so extensive. But um, that's minor compared to what they're doing down in South Jersey. And I just want you to know that I just contributed um, to my dentist's repairs in his Long Beach Island home. I just had a root canal yesterday. <laughs> and I contributed significantly to, uh, to repairing his home. <laughs> I just want to take this time to thank everyone for all your hard work. Also, I want to tell you about one of the phone calls I got. I actually did talk to Jamie at least five, six times a day, so he kept me updated. First phone call I get, individual, I won't give his name out, just starts yelling right off the bat. The power didn't go out. Jamie shut the power. He hit the switch, had nothing to do with the storm, and he could turn it on. So I said, he must really be a moron as Meredith. And he goes, I agree with you 100%. I said, the idiot shut off his own, too. So the guy just went, he goes, are you making fun of me? I said, you're kidding about this whole conversation, right? So that's about as far as it went. But anyone else that called, you know, we tried to get back to whoever we could. And the information that uh, I was getting from Jamie was outstanding and everyone. And uh, thank you, all the volunteers and everyone here for all your hard work. Thank you very much. Okay. okay, presentation, Fairview Insurance Thank you. regarding medical and dental renewals for January 1st, 2013. <laughs> You will map. Jabs. Oh, I don't think he heard. Oh, 
here he is. Hey, J yeah. Captain, can, can you? Good evening, uh, Ryan Graham, Fairview Insurance. I'm here to discuss uh, the medical renewal as well as the dental and VSP renewal. Uh, first page of the packet I gave you guys. This is just a history of your losses. And currently this year you have a very favorable loss ratio, which is 65%. As you can see, that you're trending in a very positive direction. Uh, coming from 2006 is when you guys left the state health benefits, and we just take you through the history of where you are today. Next page. This is a history of your renewal period. Uh, we dated back all the way from 2008 up to current. And as you can see this year, we expect an 8.4% increase. Your maximum exposure would be 5.5%. This is a self-insured plan, so it's based upon those two factors. Moving on to the next page. The next page is a list of all the vendors that provided a solicitation. Uh, as you see, our current renewal, which is second from the bottom, uh, is we expect an $8.547 million uh, expected cost for the year, but there's a max exposure of 11.84. Uh, we solicited the state health benefits as well. Now keep in mind the state health benefits is not equal to and better than. They don't provide traditional program as well as other benefit offerings that you currently have today. So they violate your collective bargaining agreements, but still, we still provided that quote as well, and it's uh, roughly $300,000 more than what your expected increase is for this year. The next page is just a graph showing what the uh, increase from last year to this year is. And that's just, uh, again, last year our expected was 7.8, meaning 2012, and uh, 8.5 for 2013. <clears throat> and again, this is just an overview. I, as you saw, your claims are improving. Uh, your on-site wellness coaching program is helping your overall cost of the, pro of the program. Your uh, renewals are much less than what the national average as well as the state health benefits. And our recommendation is to renew with IDA and as well as roll out uh, now with Chapter 78, we have Step 3 kicking in in July. So implementing high deductible health plans, implementing uh, higher copay plans as offerings to the employees educating them on those offerings as well as the cost to them could be beneficial and help save the uh, plan costs as well. And we can keep those ongoing as uh, Chapter 78 continues. <clears throat> the next page is your Delta Dental. Uh, we actually negotiate a decrease in your administration fees. Uh, as you see, your current cost right now is 523000 uh, We expect that to decrease down to 483000 uh, Below that are alternate quotes. As you can see, the quotes are either higher as well as they don't provide the same network. There's a heavy disruption of roughly 50% or greater. Ryan, we're self-insured on dental also, right? Yep, correct. The 
following page is just, again, an overall uh, summary of what uh, took place the page prior. Uh, as you can see, again, $39,000 decrease we expect. Other bids are more expensive and heavy network disruption. And then finally, quickly, I didn't include in this packet was your VSP program. Uh, currently, your cost of the program is $108,000. The renewal came at a 2% increase, which is $111,000. It's a four-year rate. Uh, the only competitor that came in competitive was NVA. They are $101,000. That would be a $10,000 decrease. Uh, again, NVA, they don't provide the same networks. VSP has a heavy discount. Uh, it's, it, you will feel disruption amongst your employees. Doctors won't be in NVA, but you now again, uh, we would recommend that you stay with VSP. The other thing with the um, NVA is the out-of-pocket cost for the employees would be higher. Correct. Right. Mr. Council President, uh, excuse me, I'm the, I'm the new kid on the block, and this is yeah. the first time I'm ever looking at a, a group plan for uh, on this scale. Uh, mm -hmm. When uh, in past years, when I had negotiated a uh, Health benefits for for my for my businesses. Every year, the, you know, the rates fluctuated, but also the benefits were different. Mm -hmm. When we see a list here, Aetna, Horizon, et cetera, are these identical plans as as close as it can be? Are we are we comparing apples to apples? Correct. Every plan that we provide a, that we get a solicitation, we require the carriers to provide an equal to and better than guarantee letter. Okay or else we would not make a recommendation. Okay. okay. Do you have, for the site wellness coaching program, mm -hmm. do we have any kind of like numbers on usage? Yes, we can actually, I can have a report run for you. If you can, please. Yeah. Thank you. We can send that to you guys. You said the uh, copay is gonna change? No. What was the are word? You, are you referring to the employee deduction that right. will take place in July? You in in, in uh, under Chapter 78, there's four steps. We're entering a third step come July. What that means is, by state regulation, the employees will have to pay a higher portion to their right. employee benefits. He, right. He's talking about the voluntary voluntary options that that. Oh, okay. The, with the higher deductibles yeah. and. Again, right. those are just those are plan offerings. The employees, obviously, the benefits that we have in place would remain. The employee feels it's a better option for them to take a less costing plan. It'll be there for them. Just uh, on an average, pick a number on an average. What does an employee co-pay or whatever word that Jasmine said? Like, if I worked for the town and I went to the dentist, what would be my out-of-pocket or? I mean the, the right. doctor, right? Uh, currently, it's uh, would be five dollars. In some instances, ten dollars in others, and you also have a traditional plan for some other employees, and that's just an upfront deductible. Um, what what it, other plans that are being offered today? Uh, you'll see twenty dollars copay offerings, and you'll see uh, higher deductible health plan offerings, such as a fifteen hundred dollar upfront, three thousand for a family upfront. Um, maybe I missed it. Mm -hmm. uh, the follow-up question is, what is the limit? For like a family, if I had dental work done, how much am I allowed to spend? Five thousand? Is there a cap somewhere yeah. per year for per for me family dental. member? Yeah, for that, we a thousand or fifteen hundred for fifteen hundred. Fifteen hundred. Fifteen hundred dollars. Yep. Thank you. Yep. Um, the loss ratio, mm -hmm. it, it looks good. It, is there any breakdown of why we did better? I mean, did, I knew we had some long-term expensive illnesses in the past. Have those gone away, or is, is this because of we're, we're educating our employees better? What do we attribute the I, I improvement think, to? Combination. Think, yeah. Combination. Yeah. That, we uh, also we reduced the maximum. I can't remember what it's called. To, to <clears throat> one hundred and twenty-five thousand. The maximum. Oh, the the um, uh, specific uh, stop loss. Yeah. yeah. Um, and that, that helped a lot, too. So anything over 125 gets picked up by 
by, um, an umbrella, by the an umbrella type yes policy. Could, could it the wellness program has something to do with it? Hundred uh, percent. I mean, I'm not going to obviously state anything as HIPAA violation, but you know, you do you do catch things on site. You did have some instances where folks that haven't been to the doctor in a while were discovered that they had some issues and okay. and that could have led to a much higher costing claim. It's probably lower too because we have less employees as well, right? A, f a few less. Yeah. Well, that's, but, again, but that doesn't if, change if they're the, the sick ones. It doesn't change the claim ratio. Right. Yeah. If they're the sick ones, yes. If they're the healthy ones, it wouldn't right. help. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So we'll put all three on for next week. Okay, ordinances for second read in public hearing. Everything set for next week? Uh, yes, Mr. Okay, status of adopted ordinances except for 2012 colon 36, which has been tabled. All other adopted ordinances, the adopted date was 11 27 2012. Mayor's action 11 29 2012, effective date 12 19, uh, 12 29 2012. Scheduled meetings 12 18 2012, 7 30 p.m., regular meeting, public invited, public participation. January 3rd, 2013, 7 30 p.m., reorganization, agenda meeting, public invited, public participation. Bits be taken, 12 20, 2012, 11 a.m., sealed proposals for one new 2013 International Model 4300 SBA garbage truck with 14 year split side load packer body for parks and forestry. Okay, ordinances for introduction and all resolutions. Everything good, <coughs> Desmond? Yes. Okay, township office uh, reports for engineering. All status is listed, no change. Chief Financial Officer, everything in for next week? Yes, and there's one resolution that we're asking to be adopted tonight. Okay, Mr. Creefy on that resolution. <clears throat> resolution authorizing 2012 budget appropriation transfers. Be it resolved by the Township Council of the Township of Precipity Troy Hills that the following transfers between appropriations be and the same are hereby authorized to be made in conformity with the state statutes in such cases made and provided and be it further resolved that the chief financial officer be and is hereby authorized to make the necessary entries on the books and 2012 budget in connection with said transfers current fund gasoline 200,000 will be uh, 100,000 to be transferred to Department of Law other expenses Insurance liability insurance, 65,000. Buildings and grounds, other expenses, 35,000. For a total of from 200,000 to 200,000. Motion by Mr. Carifi. Second. Second by Mr. DiPiero. Roll call. Just can I ask, may yep. I ask a question? Yep. Uh, just so I understand this right, we're taking $200,000 that was budgeted for gasoline and we just don't need that money, so we're just going to apply it towards, towards legal, legal expenses uh, and other things. Yes. Okay. Okay. Roll call. Mr. Carifi. Yes. Mr. DePiro. Yes. Mr. Ferrara. Yes. Mr. Nelson. Yes. Mr. Stanton. Yes. Applications 2013 license renewals part two. At this time, I'd like to entertain a motion to open to the public hearing. Make a motion. Motion by Mr. Carifi. Second. Second by Mr. Ferrara. Roll call. Mr. Carifi? Yes. Mr. DePiro? Yes. Mr. Ferrara? Yes. Mr. Nelson? Yes. Mr. Stanton? Yes. Okay, you'll be given five minutes in the public session. Please, if you're going to come up and speak, please come up to the front row and sign in. Again, if you're going to speak, please come up to the first two rows.
Uh, I'm here to state to, your name and address, uh, please, for the record. My name is uh, Nicholas Homiak. I live at 26 Oneida Avenue. I've been a resident of Lake Hiawatha now, uh, going into my second year. Uh, I've maybe <clears throat> I've hopefully this isn't the wrong time because uh, Sandy hasn't uh, blown through here yet, but. Uh, I have a copy here of a clean communities program, which I understand Persephone participates in. They receive fundings from the state treasury. <coughs> and I'd like to make the allegation that the present form of the clean communities and how it's applied in Persephone actually encourages and enables the exact opposite of the intention of the clean communities. And I'm going to be specific about the situation that exists on North Beverwick Road. And from what I understand, Persephone gets $85,000 a year in clean community uh, funds. And during the summer months, they hire young guys, I guess college guys, they, I guess they pay a minimum wage. And what they're engaged in is not litter abatement, which the money is supposed to go for, but for emptying trash cans that allegedly exist for the public that are dumped on by the local businesses and the local residents. Now, sometimes you can look in a garbage can, it's as easy as this. Find people's mail. You could find, right now, if you went to uh, Shingus's by Longview Avenue, where it meets North Beverwick, that particular location is constantly filled with large food containers, orange juice that hasn't been consumed, various things that you'd find in a restaurant or a business. Uh, the way I, I see it, it's an accepted norm, not, not only in Persephone, but in the whole United States, that the convenience of the corporate products and their effect on the American landscape doesn't have any effect on anybody's mind anymore. It's a norm. And I think that's wrong. And I, and I also think that if we're going to take money from a state treasury, we shouldn't turn it into a privatized program for the businesses that exist on North Beverwick so they could dump their garbage. If there's that much garbage, they should have their own dumpsters. And if we are accepting money from the state, we should, in all sincerity, try to imitate what the Clean Communities Act is supposed to encourage in a community, not take the money and run. Now, these people that come here, these young guys, they, they get the summer job, they could be cleaning up the Rockaway River, they could be cleaning up the parks, they could be cleaning up the streets from litter. They're not. They're emptying garbage cans. The litter's still in the street. I mean, it's just off the scale. So I'm here to encourage the town council to take a look at the clean communities. And I even have a suggestion where certain locations on North Beverwick that the uh, public trash receptacle should actually be removed because they're, they're actually being constantly used for dumping. And then the town, and I don't know what percentage comes from taxpayers or whatever, but it's just, there's just something wrong with the whole thing. And if we take money. 30 seconds, sir. All right. It's okay, I, go ahead, finish. I would just like to encourage the town council to take a look, and I'd be willing to come back, and I'd be willing to work with the town if, as a, in a capacity of a sanitation officer or recycle officer. Uh, I would even do it for a, a volunteer if the town and the police department would be willing to 
uh, enforce literal laws and literal ordinance in uh, Lake Hiawatha and Persephone. Can you get copies of the paperwork and just pass it? Uh, this is kind <coughs> of scrappy. Anything you have information-wise.